Economic meltdown, political corruption and government collapse. Since an Arab Spring-style uprising began in Lebanon last fall, activists have had to find ways to meet civil society's needs and keep people safe. In the process, they've collaborated in cross-class, cross-religious, cross-cultural ways that were barely imaginable in the country's civil war just a few decades back. Might the experience of Lebanon in crisis have lessons for the rest of us? I'll talk with Dana Ash, who was to receive the Commission on the Status of Women's Women of Distinction Award at the United Nations this March for her work with Haven for Artists. Haven is one of the few safe spaces run by, with, and for LGBTQI people and women in the Middle East region. And in this crisis, it's become even more significant than that. Dana Ash is my guest, fresh from Beirut, next. This is The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. So Dana, welcome. And um, I hate to make you do this because it's kind of remedial education for the rest of us. <laughs> but in a nutshell, can you describe what is happening and has been happening in Lebanon? Is the comparison to the Ab Arab Spring, spring um, accurate, fair, right? Um, I mean, in, 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 in the sense of being able to give people who've never heard about the issues that we're facing, maybe it is the best way. But um, no, it's extremely different in the sense um, that it's very grassroots and the movement in itself is for a better society and breaking the barriers of fear as we have been kind of structured into whether it be religious or regional. So if we were to beam into Beirut today or any other city you care to mention, what would we find? What would we see? What would it feel like? Uh, People have finally unified. Uh, you find a lot of people, so the revolution is no longer just on the streets. It's in everything they do. It's from going to the grocers and going to the bank and uh, interacting with their neighbors. Uh, we never used to be political in, in a sense, as at least our generation, we would kind of stay clear of it because we were a little afraid of, of the war that we had, in, yeah. you know, the anxiety that was given to us by our families. Um, now we talk about it all the time. So we were never allowed to talk about politics on the table. And now if you don't talk politics, you're not invited to the dinner today. <laughs> now you say we, but there's also a, a you in this. There's yeah. an I in this. Talk about yourself because you, have spent half of your life in the U.S., right? Yes, I grew up the first uh, part of my life in, in California, and then I moved to Lebanon when I was around 16 years old. Um, and it was a very interesting kind of uh, culture to like to readjust to because I was, in a sense, still you know very much an Arab in my identity. But growing up here, you have a different set of thinking and how you structure your life. When we moved down there, it was. Um, it was interesting to see how long it would take me to actually adjust, and it didn't take too long. Um, the city was it was quite embracing in the fact that it was lacking so much that you can find your place in any way you can. So when you say that things have changed even at the level of getting your groceries, mm. describe that for us. Um, we never talked politics. We used to walk into spaces and you would have a political leader's picture in there. Uh, so we have a lot of different sects in Lebanon and everyone kind of follows their leader and that's the region and that's the religion and everything is just kind of runs cue to this. Uh, now it's not like that. The pictures have been removed and when you walk in it's usually the grocer complaining equally as much as you. Um, and that's usually like, that's not something we expected. You usually used to talk, um, they never gave a positive look towards activism or trying to change what we were living. Now it's like, you must go down. And a lot of the older generation keeps pushing us down onto the streets, which is great. Are you excited to be part of this revolution? How does it feel? I have never been able to fully comprehend what it's like to be um, Lebanese until now. Uh, October 17th, not just solidified my identity, but solidified my understanding and my want to stay in the country. Um, we were all struggling. We were all working very hard. We work three, four jobs to be able to make ends meet. We have extremely high rent in real estate with $450 a month minimum wage. So it, the country just makes absolutely no sense. And now we've come to terms with the fact that the only reason, the only way that we can change this is if we stick together. And it's become a very, very active role that every single person is doing. You were asking how we organize now. It's We met in the squares and we've never left each other. So now everybody is interlinked from area to area, from region to region. And we communicate via WhatsApp and Instagram and Facebook to constantly, like, there's massive groups of hundreds of people just sending information back and forth. And that was something that we never had before, which is the equal dissemination of information. And how does it feel? Like it's time for a revolution. 
No, I would imagine that some things have changed because money has changed. I mean, people, when I said I was going to talk to you about Lebanon, they said, well, as far as I understand it, there's no money. You can't get means of exchange. Uh, absolutely not. I, the money has disappeared. It disappeared a long time ago, and I think that that was the facade that our government was able to pull off for so long. No, is that just a, a, a euphemism? Are you just talking sort of conceptually? No, no, no. We're in negative 60 billion, I think. So you uh, reach in your pocket? You reach, go to the ATM? We can't withdraw money from the ATM. I think it's $50 a month now that we're allowed to withdraw. Um, and our uh, currency was originally pecked at a dollar, so it was 1,500 liras to every one dollar, which was the financial engineering uh, that they had kind of concocted for 30 years. And then suddenly um, we are at 2,750, which means our value of currency has dropped by 50%. Um, and that means our salaries have dropped by 50%, but the cost of living has increased because we import 90% of what we use and consume in the country. So it's nice to have political conversations with your grocer, but what are you eating? <laughs> Well, we try as best as we can. So like, in the end, the country is not completely um, falling apart. We do grow a lot. Um, we just, the country has never invested in its own yeah. kind of sectors. It's never cared about investing in its people. Um, it was always about creating deals with the rest of the world and our politicians. That was their way, I think, of uh, kind of you know pocketing a, a bunch of the deals themselves or whether it be contracting or otherwise. You have an enormous number of banks for a fairly small country. Yeah, I think it was around 150, something like that, 130 to 150 banks um, in 10,500, uh, 10,452 meters squared. So why so many banks? Because our politicians own them. So all of our politicians have shares within all of these banks. Um, so originally, we were supposed to be, we were a country that produced a lot. And we produced silk and we produced, so the royal color that's known for royalty was actually produced in Lebanon. Um, I think it was around the 1920s, they decided that we were going to be a banking company, a country. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, uh, so they started shifting into the banking sector and that was where everything uh, went. And Riyad Salem's financial engineering was that he was going to give high interest rate to our diaspora so that they invest money into the country. But if there's money coming into the country but there's no circulation of money, which means the money is not actually accumulating and it's just getting pocketed by all of these private sector banks, in the end you're going to go into a massive recession. Which is exactly what's happened. Um, this spring, I think Lebanon defaulted on its loans yes. to international finance for the first time. $4.6 billion owed this year. And now, well, the default in a way, kind of what they're saying is going to be pushing into creating a new strategy to restructure our debt and see how we're going to pay it back. Um, but the Lebanese citizens are saying, we will not pay this debt. Um, you have to pay it because we're aware of your bank accounts and your numbers and your corporations and how many banks you own, and yet we're the ones starving. So we are not going to be the ones to hold up that. So the reason I'm so excited to talk to you, as if people wouldn't have figured this out by now, is that I hear as if it were a little bit of a sort of news dispatch from a possible future where one has entirely financialized one's economy. Mm. One has allowed politicians to accrue the benefit of power and money from that financialization. Yeah. And people are suffering. Absolutely. Then comes the uprising part. What was it that triggered the uprising, per se? Uh, well, there were multiple factors. They built up to it. Other than the fact that we've been building up for 30 years. <laughs> um, in particular, there were the fires that engulfed all of Lebanon. Um, they burned half of the shuf. And this our... was at the same time people may have seen the pictures from Australia. Exactly. But there were similar fires happening where you are. The yeah. beautiful cedars of Lebanon were half scorched. Like most of the mountains were really just really in disparity. Um, the biggest, I think, moment for us was when a reporter was up in shuf and she started crying on national television, saying, I can't believe I'm hearing people screaming in their houses. Um, and our government didn't react. Actually, volunteer firefighters, including Palestinian firefighters, volunteered and went and did this. Mm. Most of the area, the region was, you know, just local neighbors going out and trying to turn this fire off. We had three helicopters that we had been gifted, um, and we needed to just do maintenance on them, which I think was around two, three million or something like that. And, and at some point, one of the governments donated another 13 million for maintenance, and then the 13 million disappeared, and the helicopters were never maintained. That was kind of like the big slap to everybody face of we always knew there was corruption we always were aware of how much stealing stealing there was but we weren't aware of just the amount of incompetence that was kind of riddling uh, our entire structure incompetence another word that seems very familiar to us <laughs> um, the other thing that I want us to mention before we get into the Haven and your award and the, what is flowering in the 
context of this resistance is, of course, the refugee crisis, which we hear a certain amount about. Lebanon has been one of the countries to take millions, or at least about a million, mm. of refugees just from Syria. We're not talking about Palestine. We're not talking about some that have been there earlier, migrant yeah. workers, but just Syrian refugees. So what pressure is that putting on the people and the government? Well, in my opinion, I don't think there's pressure because the government should be adequate enough to know how to handle that situation. They open the doors, they need to be able to handle it. If they are allowing these people to come in, they need to present them with some kind of standard of living. The United Nations is working there, UNHCR, all of them work there. And there are deals with the government. I just don't think the government cares enough to negotiate the best deals. So in the context of all of this, <laughs> you are running a safe space for women and LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, and inquiring, questioning people um, in the middle of Beirut. Yeah. For artists, but also a safe space for women and for people. Well, you tell me, what's the status of LGBTQI people in <laughs> Lebanon today? Oh, that's my favorite subject. Um, we have a law called uh, 534, which uh, sends us, or it's called the unnatural act. So if in any way we are deemed unnatural, which is LGBTQI in their opinion, um, we can face up to a year in jail. And now this has been kind of negated sometimes by, by great judges who have you know, read the law and go, this makes no sense and it's not applicable in, co in accordance to our constitution. But most judges don't go down that route and there have been a lot of issues whether it be with the law itself but it's also the social uh, aspects of it so even if they were to absolve this law we still need to work a lot on how people perceive lgbtqi um, in lebanon and how we can overcome that but 534 is, is pretty much a very um, it's a painful number for us to handle and i think those three numbers are probably the, the things that we can't really comprehend either so why an art center uh, I believe the intersection of art and activism is, is the, the pillars of change for society. I think that's the best way for us to be able to not just combine our efforts and our research and our knowledge, but to be able to disseminate this information in a way that's accessible and that's understandable. We want to reach the most amount of people, and it's not just about reaching people so that they know what we're doing, mm -hmm. but they, so they know what, what's happening to them. Because most of the people I think in this world are not aware of how everything affects them and just how far and how much one particular thing, that domino effect, how that can really destroy their life somewhere down the line. And with Haven, we always you know, viewed our work as necessary because we also need expression. And in that, we had the non-confrontational essence of just being ourselves in the artistic realm. Um, working with activists, we're able to exchange these tools so that we can create great campaigns that outreach and create more of a movement. And so that artists also have access to these activists to get proper research and information before they create a piece. So there's a beautiful film mm. available on YouTube made yeah. by your friend Tanya Safi. Yes, she's a wonderful director. About Haven. Yes. Let's take a little look. Do you identify as an out woman? Yes. As a, as a lesbian woman? Can you say that? Yes. <laughs> this will be the first time I say it on camera. Um, I identify as a lesbian woman. I identify as a lesbian Arab woman. And I got tattoos. My name is Dana Ash and I'm the executive director of Haven for Artists. And what is Haven? Haven is the only LGBTQI and women safe space in uh, all of Beirut in which we can be extremely open and extremely free. Our initial intention is to be an all-inclusive art and cultural space. We are here to support every other NGO. We are here to support every artist. We are here to support every activist. But we know who needs it most. flowers on Women's Day and then we always buy extra so that we can give women every other day and say every day is Women's Day. Hmm. People that do come here intentionally are people coming here in order to be free, in order to express themselves freely, to be themselves, to dress in any way or form that they would like to, to uh, converse and not feel pretentious, to, uh, to love and not feel hated. And the community just grew and grew on the basis that the space was there. Being raised in the States made me arrogant and ignorant to the strife of others. And when I came to my country and I thought that I could be liberal and free and out and, and proud and all of that, and I was faced with my family saying, no, you cannot, no, you cannot. That's when I realized that this was a privilege that I was given that my country should be giving its citizens as well. And that's when I began working on Haven. In that film, mm. you come out as a lesbian and you say it's your first time. Yeah. Um, well, speaking as a fellow lesbian, I'm. I'm pleased with you, for, proud of you, and excited for you doing that. But 
in the context of this war was not like the ideal time to come out, or was it? Uh, well, I've always been out. Uh, I'm very outspoken about who I am, and um, but there's out, and then there's out on video. Yeah, that's that was a that was a moment. Um, but I I didn't. I, I think it was also Tanya, the way she is and the way she presents herself and, and her being, uh, in an essence, a great filmmaker. She was just, it made, made me feel extremely comfortable. And in the end, I wanted people to understand that there are Arab lesbians um, and that it's not, we are, this misconception that we are looked at with oppression and yes, we are oppressed, but we're also fighting back. Um, we are proud in a different sense than how, you know, the West can be proud. And our job is to continue to change that misconception and to bridge so that we can create dialogue between all of the world. And how is that work intersecting, because it intersects in your body and your daily life and who you are, with the resistance around the regime and the militarization and the financialization and the poverty and the lack of food? Well, uh, they're, they're, I always say that we have, we have to fight a revolution on all fronts. There's no such thing as, well, we'll do this first and then we'll work on this. Um, if we continue to do that, then people will always take advantage and prioritize their own needs over the needs of everyone else's. I believe that freedom is for every single one of us to design and not for one single person to define. Therefore, it is our responsibility to ensure that we are fighting on all fronts and making sure that everyone is moving, even if one inch at a time, together. Mm. Um, so what concrete role is Haven playing and the people who are part of Haven in this context of now? In the revolution in yeah. itself. So we're just, we, as Haven, we, first of all, we've been on strike for five months. Our organization refuses to work. We actually closed our doors during the revolution and didn't say anything. We just moved our furniture and went back to the streets. It was four of us that moved the entire space. Um, and we were in our clothes ready to go back with our tear gas and tear gas masks just waiting. Um, so we moved the house and we went straight back. Um, and that was mainly because at that point, people were on the streets and that's where they were going to need to stay. Uh, so there wasn't this much need for the space to continue opening its doors in that sense, um, especially since we ourselves were on the street mm -hmm. and on the front lines. Um, the entire team is very involved in the revolution in their own way, each in their own manner. And it has nothing to do with just Haven. Haven is there to support everyone who comes forward. So any activist that comes in and says, I need Haven's this, this or this, Haven is there to offer it. But Haven in itself as an entity is not functioning programs. Its artists and its people are functioning on the ground. And what's changing, or is anything changing, in the relationship of the LGBT community and the rest of the community in resistance as people come together around basic needs? Well, I, I don't think I've ever seen um, this amount of queer graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful because there's, yes, queer here, and the queer has built Beirut, and it's everywhere in the city. Um, but mainly it's the fact that we got to a point where before it was the um, being queer was, or being LGBTQ was a, an offensive term. So if you want to offend someone, you would call them that. And I think you in America, you guys have We're the familiar. same word. Um, you have that translation, that word. So they would do that. Now we've created, and it came out organically, um, people that usually would be extremely offensive, they were always against LGBT, have gone to a point where they're in the middle of the protest using this derogatory term to refer to one of our politicians, and then the LGBT community within that same protest would scream at them and say, no, this is not a curse word. And they slowly stopped using mm, that. Mm. I mean, it's not 100% blanketing, but it is a massive progress mm. from what it used to be. And even women's rights, um, the way women have taken hold, they've always been there and they've always been present. And women have always been leading revolutions in Lebanon for at least the last hundred years. But when it comes down to it, this is the first revolution where people started paying attention and filming it. Granted, social media really does help with that, but women have really just amplified and they've started switching because we also in Arabic, we only have curse words that relate to the woman. So if you want to curse a man out, you have to curse his mother, his sister, and then you get to him. Um, so we've also started in the middle of the chance to refuse the uses of just women. So we attack the actual person rather than his mother and his sister and all of that. There's also a role for the diaspora, mm. for, for Lebanese people who are living all around the world, of which there are many, many. many. Um, <laughs> what's that role been? Well, I think each one of them has had their own capacity. Um, some have taken on creating social media accounts to just support with what they can as far as disseminating information. Some have been sending funds and assistance to ensure that people you know, under the poverty line are still being fed. I think the most beautiful thing about this revolution is just the amount of, uh, of unification, because they had done so well um, at just 
creating this very, very great divide. Um, and it's an elusive divide because it wasn't really physically there. It's just we wouldn't cross into each other's areas. We didn't feel welcome. We didn't think that we were allowed to. And now it's um, people from different areas all over Lebanon traveling around Lebanon to feed each other. Mm. Um, so I don't know if they're aware of it, but the longer they starve people, the more um, they're going to be unified against them. Um, and it's very obvious now, as, as the default has happened. You also mentioned when we talked before something about jobs for Lebanon. Yeah, there's a, there's a new thing that the diaspora launched, actually, where they are trying within their own organizations and their own companies to try to give opportunities to people that are living in Lebanon so they can get a job. So it's just about being able to apply online and get that little, um, that little push that you might need because we can't access our money in the bank accounts. And there is, I think it's, it's officially now around 50 to 55 percent unemployment. So people are able to actually sign up online for a remote position or doing a remote job yeah. for a company run by a Lebanese person or someone else who wants to hire a Lebanese exactly. person um, around the world. Around the world. So yeah. it's not charity. They actually have a job. They have a lot of work to do. Yeah. No. The, the, and there is one thing I have to say about the Lebanese people is that they're extremely resilient. I mean, when you survive so much occupation and then you finish that into more civil war and then you finish that and you're rebuilding your country, it just doesn't it doesn't end. So our resilience is, is profound. But the matter of the fact is, is we have 4 million, peop 4 million Lebanese people living in Lebanon, but we have 16 million living abroad. Mm. Um, so it's only time that, it's only right that all of these kind of bridges and links begin to, you know, be recreated. What of your experience in Lebanon do you think would be helpful for us here, um, who are for sure trying to figure out how to be more resilient, how to come together across divisions, mm. how to deal with corruption, um, economic meltdown, and a global pandemic at the moment. <laughs> we're talking. Um, I think the first thing that, that this country needs is to come out of its kind of the stupor that they've put you in, whether it be uh, through capitalism or consumerism. Step away from your screen for five minutes and really try to look at the other person living across the street from you, especially in, in New York, let's say. I mean, you have so much diversity that you actually have direct access to other people's strife and experience. I don't think enough people talk about each other's strife and experience here. I also don't think they care enough because they're so um, content with being able to order on Amazon Prime that they forget that there is a life outside that is you know, more than just a t-shirt that arrives at your door. And somebody's putting that stuff in that box and getting, getting it there. Yeah. So it's just about being able to expand that. And, and for me, it's insane because everybody keeps, I've heard this a lot, especially in the last week that I've been here. Everyone's like, how do we do this? How do we do this? What well, you need to do, period. There is no more how do we. You get on the streets, you protest, you, um, you call for organizing, uh, uh, you know, just a strike. Uh, what they did in Iceland, I believe it was 75% of all women went on strike to change their system. And now it's a, one of the best economies in the world. Um, I think it's ludicrous for us to think that the power is not in the hands of the people. Mm -hmm. They want you to think that, and they've conditioned us into believing that we have no power. But when they say, go vote, it just, in its sense, in itself, gives you the understanding that mm. you actually have all the power. And even if you vote wrong, protest. <laughs> well, we're often told voting is our only option. Mm. Um, and then the other thing we're told is that people in the streets just materialize magically. Dr. King's huge rallies just kind of appeared. Up. Yeah. Um, I don't suppose what you've been seeing in the streets in Lebanon is entirely unorganized or spontaneous. What has actually gone into not just an experience expression or explosion of people's frustration, but the maintenance of this resistance um, in strenuous ways for so long. Yeah, so the, the spark of the revolution was absolutely organic in the sense that none of us knew that we were going down and we just did. And it was because of an MP bodyguard firing live ammo into the air to disperse protesters. All of us were just, you know, at home on Facebook or on Instagram or whatever, and we had that video pop. And within seconds, the entire country was on the streets. And when I mean the entire country, I mean the entire country mm. within the first week had hit the streets. And a woman actually, which is the symbol of the revolution at this point, who's also now being sued by that, by that MP, um, and, and she's being sent to military court. It's not just, yeah, she's not going to civil court. And the name of the woman? Um, Malak, I believe. She's, she's just, become Malak. She is the Malak, which is which means angel. <laughs> and that's how we felt it, because she really did. She drop kicked him in the stomach and flew him back. Um, and she was surrounded, actually, by a bunch of guys. And instead of all of them being, because nobody reacts that quickly, Malak reacted in an instant. And that's been kind of the, the momentum that can be seen every single day in the revolution, is women reacting in a way that, you know, everyone always expected Middle Eastern women not to. And maintaining it? Are you also taking responsibility for 
feeding people, schooling people, looking after people if so much is shut down? Well, we've, I think civil society and NGOs and independent actors and activists have been doing that for years. Um, we've been doing it actually as Haven, we've been doing it for 11 years and we're a nonprofit and um, most of us are volunteers. And there are places like Re uh, Recycle Lebanon, there's plenty of organizations that are functioning constantly, that have been con functioning for years, um, that suddenly have now shown themselves. They've always been there, it's just the government has kind of, you know, not really made use of them like they should have. Because we don't recycle in Lebanon, we don't get rid of our trash. We had a trash crisis and we had protests um, and still nothing happened. So you get to a point where it's like, okay, how do you react to this? And if it wasn't for civil society, I don't, I don't think we would have been able to function as a country. I wish it sounded more remote and foreign. No, it's, it's quite similar to the state. And that's, that's what I mean for, for when I say that the American citizen needs to wake up and realize that capitalism is, is the issue in their life. And I, I'm not saying abolish capitalism. Obviously that's gonna take whatever time that needs to be, but there needs to be an awareness that capitalism does not put people first. Capitalism puts the bank account first. And we need to work around that so that everyone has money and can live a, you know, a life of dignity. Dana Ash is our guest. There's more information about her work and The Haven. And if I had the award here, I would give it to you. I'm very okay. sorry that the Commission on the Status of Women was canceled because of the coronavirus. Um, you will be getting many more awards, I'm sure. You <laughs> yes. and yours. Thanks. So thanks for coming to town. Thank you for having me. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show. More information at our website.